What's up, everyone? Hello and welcome to On the Preds with me, your host, Alex Dory of A to Z Sports and Sean Smith of On the Forecheck. We are ready for the holidays, as you can tell. Uh, it is Christmas time. We got all the decorations up. And we got uh, some Santa Claus going on. We have several gifts under the tree, uh, if you can tell. Uh, so several presents under the tree. Maybe we'll unwrap those a little bit later on. Uh, but we are here to to recap the Preds. Sean, it has been a weird week for the Nashville Predators. It has been weird, to say the least. I, I, <laughs> I definitely uh, recall walking into Bridgestone Arena to cover the Avalanche game mm -hmm. and thinking about what an odd odd night it was going to be beforehand and then getting there and realizing how much stranger it was than I was expecting. That's for sure. Yeah. It, we're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, it, it was, uh, that was, that was kind of the peak uh, strangeness of the week. Uh, and then we'll obviously talk about uh, what's going to happen in the next week, which is not much. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll cover that as well. Um, try to catch you up. I tried to get the timeline, right? I mean, it's, it's, well, I didn't really actually try to get the timeline right. I tried to get as much information as I could for this show. But uh, for the most part, it's very difficult to follow along. Like for your – if you're trying to figure out exactly what happened to win, it's very difficult to identify that. So uh, we won't necessarily try to do that. But let's go ahead and jump into it because there's three games that happened this past week going all the way back to last Sunday. So we recorded last Sunday, and then now here we are. Uh, later that night, the, the Predators played the – Rangers and uh, Sean's going to tell you about that one. Then I'm going to take the other two. Go ahead and just let's just get it going. Let's just roll it, roll it. Yeah, you know uh, it was funny to think back this being part of this week because uh, this this game happened not too long after we recorded our last episode. So I guess mm -hmm. you could call this game the calm before the storm because when I went back and looked at some of the highlights, I saw a lot of players who were soon to be added to the COVID protocol. But both teams right. had outstanding performances by their goaltenders. Um, even though his team lost, Alex Georgiev uh, looked outstanding in the net. And, of course, UC Soros was perfect literally in the shutout. The first and last goal of the game came when Philip Forsberg found Philip Tomasino wide open in the crease uh, or in the slot. And uh, Tomasino completing the fill-to-fill -fill connection fired off a wrist shot that easily found the back of the net. Georgiev didn't have a chance because Mikhail Granlin was locked up with Keandre Miller in front of the net, completely took away his eyes. I mean, if you go back and look at the highlight, you can't even see Georgia back there. It's just a giant dude and a pretty big dude locked up. It's like the goalie's not there. Um, it was definitely an identity win for the Preds because players like Matt Benning in the bottom six of the lineup absolutely shut down the Rangers. Uh, yeah, it was it was crazy, right? I mean, like I did not think when that Tomasino goal went in, I, I definitely didn't think that was going to be the only goal of the game. Uh, I mean, it was a really nice goal, but it just kind of came out of nowhere. And um, <clears throat> what the, you know, the Rangers do have some firepower. You know, they're a decent team. They're not they're they're not last year's Rangers. They're pretty good. Yeah. Um, but it was uh, it was just a, a, a sight to see. I mean, UC Soros was great. Uh, obviously with, with a shutout and uh, we would see more of him later on in the week, but it's weird, right? Because it does feel like that game <clears throat> was almost like a different season, right? Like after that game, yeah. the, the next, the next uh, iteration of the Nashville Predators began, right? Yeah. It was, it was like looking at a different team. Um, I went, I went back just to, just to check the, uh, the setup of that goal and, I kept seeing guys, and I'm like, oh, he didn't – I haven't seen him, and it, it's weird. It's like looking into um, – using a time machine or something and going back and seeing a, an earlier iteration of the team from a previous season based right. on what happened afterwards. And we, d we do not have a time machine, but we will pretend to as we talk about this past week. Um, okay, so we already knew that the Calgary game would be canceled. Uh, that was already canceled – or not canceled, postponed. Uh, because Calgary's games were postponed through, like, you know, basically a full week. So we already yeah. knew that Tuesday was not going to happen. And then we start hearing that there are uh, positive cases with the Predators uh, going into that. We're going to try to break all that down uh, as much as we can after we do these recaps. But but basically, what I'd like to do is go ahead and recap the games that happened. And then – because – I guess let's just talk about it. Let's just talk about Colorado because that, that game was 
uh, you know, a game that I really won't soon forget. Like I, I, that, that whole experience was very strange because after several days filled with like new positive cases of COVID call ups and then last second line shuffles where there's like even guys um, potentially on the ice, but that we don't know if they're going to play or not. Um, the Preds would actually play the Colorado Avalanche after several days of really not really sure if that was going to happen. They would play the Colorado Avalanche. Sean and I were both there and the game was honestly like kind of in doubt up until puck drop. I mean, we did not know if that game was going to happen because I mean, the Avalanche only had 15 skaters out on the ice for warmups. Uh, they would, they would eventually play with 16 players. They had to have an e-bug. Uh, what's his name? De- Devin Smith. Is that his name? I don't, I don't know. Uh, Dustin, Dustin, D- Dustin, Dustin Smith, yeah. uh, who is, a, who is an emergency backup goaltender for the, for, for the Predators who just is in house. He was on the bench for the Avalanche. They didn't have a backup. <clears throat> And then the bigger issue for the Predators was they had no coaching staff. Every single coach. We, we go, went into it thinking that Dan Hynote was going to be the coach. And then literally that morning at availability, they announced that Dan Hynote is now in COVID protocol. So we're like, where are the coaches? There are no coaches for this Nashville Predators team. Lo and behold, one Mr. Carl Taylor comes into town. Carl Taylor, along with Scott Ford and Scott Nickel, uh, Scott Nickel, assistant GM, uh, Scott Ford, assistant coach, and then Carl Taylor, head coach of the Milwaukee Admirals. So they come in, and uh, you, so what you've got here is an AHL coaching staff stepping into an NHL team consisting mostly of AHL players. So it's it's almost like you get this like weird um, trial period where the coach gets to step in with his AHL coach or his AHL team and play an NHL game. It, it was such a bizarre situation because of how it all played out. So, um, but I, as I said, the, 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 they did have coaches there. The abs were really, really short on players for the first 15 minutes of the game. The abs played with only 15 skaters and then Jack Johnson joined the team and they still only had 15 skaters. Hashtag joke. Uh, most of the coaching uh, the we'll talk more about the coaching situation and Carl Taylor and all that later on. But Forsberg gets the Predators on the board with a long wrist shot. It almost looked like Roman Yossi on that play. That gets by Frank Kuz. And then uh, in the second period, Tanner Janot had this power play goal, which I'd like to show now. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why there's been some talk about people wanting to see more Tanner Janot on the power play. So let's take a look at this real quick. This was uh, in the second period to put the Predators uh, up to nothing. In the back of the net, Brantos, no chance. Look at that quick, quick puck movement, and then what a finish there by Janot. Look at Sissons, he's waiting, he's got this. Janot gets in that quiet space right there and just rips it. Two nothing. He got in the quiet space right in the slot there. One thing about that play that I really, really like that Janot does. If you notice, he is he's uh, he's sitting back behind the defense, like higher in the zone. And then as soon as Sissons gets the puck, he moves toward the goal. He doesn't stand in the same place. He moves toward the goal as if he's ready to launch himself into space. And he's launching himself towards the goal because he knows that puck is coming from Colton Sissons. And once it gets there, he's going to be able to launch it on net with even more velocity, which is what happened. And he got it right by the goalie and made it 2 nothing. So that was an impressive play. Uh, after that, just to finish up the recap here, uh let's see what happened colorado scores to make it 2-1 but then forsberg gets his second goal on a two-on-one where he was really trying to shoot the puck uh, i'm sorry he was trying to pass the puck to tanner Janot, and uh, it kind of deflects off of sam gerard former pred that made it 3-1 the game kind of got out, a bit out of hand at that point you know the, the avalanche are, are tired and they look pretty dead five to two was the final um let's talk about this game a little bit more because there was just this was nuts right Oh, this was this was definitely like you said, a game I'm not going to forget. And I mean, even if I'd watched it on TV um, and hadn't known anything about what was going on, I think, like you said, it would have been obvious toward the end of the game that the Avalanche were getting pretty exhausted. Um, but you know, I, I think there was this odd air, at least. And I have to, I have to remember, um, you know, going into this game, you know, not everybody is is aware of the larger picture here. Um, yeah. I've had some friends say, you know, how oh, do you think tonight's going to be a pretty good game? And I kind of looked at him like, 
I don't know if tonight's game is going to be a game at all. And they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> um, I said, well, there's a lot going on. And I tried to explain, but you know, the, the reality was <clears throat> anybody who's keeping up would know that things were going to be odd. And, and we weren't really, I think, aware of the impact the COVID protocol was having on Colorado, much less. I mean, we knew what was going on with Nashville. We'd lost coach after coach after player after player. Um, but to, to show up and see the players come out on the ice for the first time for warmups, you know, you could very obviously tell there weren't enough guys out there. Yeah. Um, and I think that was one of the more bizarre things was it, it almost looked like, okay, something's, something's up here. How many of these guys are actually on the ice? How many are here? How many are supposed to be there? And, and once you start kind of processing all of those things from up in media row, you realize, they don't have enough guys on ice and yeah, of course yeah. and and as we talked about the problem with that is not necessarily about it, it really has nothing to do with covid it has to do with in an nhl game if you are down let's let's just say they had 16 skaters because that's what they eventually had they were waiting on jack johnson's covid test i guess and when they had that so they have 16 skaters so you've they, they basically had 11 forwards and 5d right is that right yeah they i think or was it ten and six? It was uh, it was ten yeah. and five. Ten and five. So then, so it was ten and six when Jack Johnson got out there. Yeah, yeah. Ten forwards, six de- six defensemen. The problem is, so th- so basically, they can only really roll three lines, three forward lines. Now the Predators had eleven and seven. They had eleven forwards and seven defensemen uh, out there because they were short of forwards, so they went seven D. Um, but the problem with only having that amount of players is if you get injured in an NHL game, if, 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 an, if an avalanche player was to get injured, which happens all the time in games, it's an exponential problem, right? Like you get, you get one injury and then all of a sudden the rest of those guys have to play even more minutes, which yeah. leads them more likely to get injured. Uh, and, and then you have a really dangerous situation where you've got guys who are potentially playing injured out there in an NHL game that they want to try to win. Um, I, I just, I, I'm really surprised that the game happened. I'm glad that no one got seriously injured afterwards, but you know, that I, I was just really surprised that it, it actually happened that way. Um, there were rumors about something about a vote, like the Colorado was given a chance to, to play uh, or to play or not to play. And they, they chose to play. I mean, look, it, I don't think there's any single athlete in the world, professional athlete in the world, that if you say, hey, would you like to play this game or would you not like to play? They're going to be like, yeah, I want to play. So that was a bit unfair. I, I think that was kind of an unfair story that came out. But also, why is the league put the, putting them in that situation? Like, you 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 need to be the better – you need to be the, the, the guardian here and step in and say – they're going to want to play no matter what. Even if it's just five guys on the ice, they're going to want to play. We need to step in and make a decision. Yeah, if you look at it, like you said, I like the, the way you use the guardian because because the reality here, you know, you and I are both parents, and we see we see kids getting into a situation that's potentially dangerous. The smart thing to do is to intervene and say, hey, guys, come on, somebody's yeah. going to get hurt, quit being dumb. Um, yeah, they're going to say they want to play. I mean, if that's the case, if they were given the option, hey, do you guys want you want to play this game? And they took a vote and they said yes. I mean, of course they're going to say yes. They've they've traveled all this way. They've got all their gear on. They're ready to drop the puck in a few minutes. Supposedly that vote happened after warm-ups. You know, after we were sitting there yeah. watching them down. It wasn't like they voted earlier in the day and then had people pop up on the list. It was, you know, between warm-ups and game time where they took that, uh, supposedly took the vote. And of course they're going to say yes. They're ready to go. They've got They've got their adrenaline going, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody's gone through their pregame routine. They're ready. They're going to say yes, whether it's a detriment to their health, safety, or the team's record. Regardless, that's what they're going to say. And you just you yeah. expect the league to say, we don't need to do this. This isn't what we need going on. But that's what happened. It was very weird. Uh, but, the, you know, the, the game the game concluded. It, it ended 5-2, Predators win. That would be their sixth straight win. And then the very next night, the Predators go into Chicago. Uh, so they have a back-to-back going to Chicago. And then, even then, you're like, wow, is this game going to happen? Because now the Predators are down eight players for COVID. They have enough skaters because they've got a plenty of guys from Milwaukee that came up. We'll talk about that in a second. 
but they had plenty of plenty of players. But like, you know, are they uh, is the league going to step in now because they had all these positives? Uh, the answer is no. They did not step in, and the Predators played in Chicago. Uh, I thought it was very strange that UC Soros got the second start on the back-to-back, considering everything else. Like, why did David Riddick not start? But whatever. Uh, he started and was great. So um, UC Soros doing his best, you know, this this is this is UC Soros at his peak, where he's just, like, really good in net and very reliable and is going to give you a really solid chance to win every single night. So it's hard to blame him for that. Were you going to say something? Oh, you know, I, I wasn't super surprised that they played Soros because you're, you're kind of going into an unknown situation for two days. And then you, you suddenly have, oh, you're going to play a game two nights in a row. And the first night you played against, uh, I guess, an understaffed team. Well, the Chicago Blackhawks are still the full Chicago Blackhawks, as far as I could tell. Um, I don't think they were dealing with any outbreaks or, yeah. or protocol issues. So you're playing a division rival. You're, you're, you know, this one really, really matters and you have a chance to get a win. You know, you want to give yourself the best chance for that win. And I think Soros, even on, you know, no rest is probably going to be your best bet against a uh, fully loaded Chicago team. He probably is considering that the backup David Riddick has not been great. Um, that's about the only situation. There's all kinds of numbers out there about, about how goalies perform worse on a set on zero days rest, but you know, uh, this, this is such a weird situation. I, I think it's, I'm, I'm not as, if this were just a normal year and then they just did this for no reason, I would be like, what are you doing? But yeah. it, it, it's, it, it's, it might as well have happened now. Um, okay. So uh, the game starts and Tommy Novak gets his first NHL goal. So that was cool. Uh, and he scored it on a soon to be hall of fame goaltender, Mark Andre Fleury in the United center. So, I think he won't soon forget that. Uh, that that seems like something that will stick with him forever. Uh, it was a great goal. He just, I mean, he just wired it right by him. That was really nice. Later on, Kirby Doc ties it up. Excuse me, later in the first. But then Colton Sissons gets his fourth goal of the year. And I wanted to show this just because I wanted to show how close it was. Um, it was a great play by Forsberg to, um, to get the pass over to him. And uh, Sissons gets the shot off. And like, I, it looked to me like Flurry made the stop, but then it just kind of bounced through and squeaks by. Let's yeah. go ahead and watch that real quick because uh, I just wanted to show how close it was. Over and he gets a piece of this, Pat. I thought he stopped it, but it hits his glove, the bottom part of the glove and finds the back of the net and the reaction from Forsberg in behind. He was like the goal judge back in the day where he saw this puck completely over the line. He was the first one to see it. But the athleticism there by Fleury going right to left. Hawks look. It's really a pretty interesting shot because he puts it in a place that's that's a really difficult save for a goalie to make. It's in between his pad and his glove, right? So uh, if you notice, yeah. Fleury's glove is going down. He's moving his glove down as opposed to coming up. You know, most goalies want to be able to, to to put the glove up because it's just easier to make the catch that way. But when he's going down, it's a little harder to get that glove down in the right angle to stop that puck. So that's when it bangs off the glove and then starts rattling around and then squeaks through. So it's a good place. It's a good place to shoot um, for 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 Sissons. I mean, that's why it was a good shot, uh, even though it did get a little lucky on the bounce because uh, Flurry got you know a piece of it. So, um, but anyways, that was a good play by by Sissons. That was his fourth goal of the year. Uh, the Hawks tie it up uh, in the third period when uh, Jonathan Taves is basically left wide open on the back door. I think someone lost their stick and was like going after it. Was it Trennan or was it? Do you remember that? I I don't remember that. There was a lot of uh, chaos at the house at that moment. Someone, so. someone, a predator player, a def- defenseman maybe, or a, I can't remember who it was, lost their stick and was going after it, and then that kind of left a wide open um, guy in the back. I mean. There's a lot. There's a lot of people who think you know if you lose your stick, don't go pick up your stick. You just stay on. You just stay upright because you're more likely to get in the way of the puck, or you can still body someone up without your stick, especially on defense. And then there's people who are just like, uh, just go get it as quickly as you can. I mean, he. I don't know that that person. I, I can't remember who it was. Uh, made the wrong decision. I. It's it's really tough to say in that situation. I mean, the best the best thing is just don't drop your stick. But. Um, <laughs> so what's, I don't know. What's Anyways, your opinion? What, what yeah, should you do, according to the Alex Doherty School of Hockey? I, 
I would say go your stick. I, I would say it, it like when you drop your stick, you have to kind of make a quick assessment. How far is it? Is it is it right underneath me, or do I have to skate to go get it? If I have to skate to go get it, well, okay. In a rec game, I'm just gonna go get my stick because it's not that big of a deal. I'm I'm gonna go take my time and go get my stick because I can't do anything without my stick. But if if I'm an NHL player, I probably have to make a quick assessment. If my stick goes flying down the ice, I can't go skate after it. I have to stay in the play, especially on defense. But like you probably need to, um, it, it, I don't know. It, it's I I think most of the time you probably want to go get your stick. Most of the time, I think that's a fair assessment. I think that's there's. I think there's two things in, in hockey that look very silly. One of them is a goalie without his uh, upper body protection on, but the lower <laughs> body protection on. I think it looks like some of those nesting dolls that are not put together right. The other is somebody out with their hands out trying to block the, oh, yeah. I'm going to stop the puck here with my with my very a thinly player. gloved hands. You're right. You're right. Uh, uh, anytime there's a skater on the ice without a stick, just going like this and trying yeah. to skate and trying to kick the puck. It does look like the goofiest thing ever. And you're right about the goalie with no top. That is very true. They look very uh, – almost like a Star Wars character. They look like a droid from Star Wars. Um, so, anyways, they, they tie it up. But then uh, here we go with another Tanner Janot uh, beauty here. This was this was such a great goal um, in overtime. So, they, they take it to overtime. Um, and this time it's Roman Yossi. This looks very similar to the Forsberg to, to, to Janot where Forsberg – was trying to pass to Juno and it banked in off of Gerard in the Avalanche game. This time, Rowan Yossi connects the pass and Juno does not disappoint. Pleasant surprises in the league are now nine games over 500. Oh, brilliant pass by Roman Yossi. Hawks looked like they had something going on. Kane had the puck after taking the puck right in the face, settled it down. Just a perfect pass by Roman Yossi right on the tape to Tanner Janot, who just deflects it home and then falls backwards onto the uh, United Center ice, giving the Predators a 3-2 to two victory. You know you know what they should call that pass? What? The Norris pass. The Norris pass. <laughs> he, 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 he spent it between the legs of that defender. That was pretty that was, nice. He timed that it perfectly. Beautiful. So... Tanner Janot with two goals uh, this week, right? Or is it three? I know, he, I know he had at least two. No, yeah, didn't score in the Rangers game, and he scored in the Avalanche game. Yeah, two goals this week. Tanner Janot has been just, like, just awesome. And um, uh, that guy's story is so cool, and he just keeps performing and keeps playing. And, I mean, I, I don't see any reason why that guy can't just be a staple of this Nashville Predators team for like, you know, a decade. I mean, that guy's just gonna, he doesn't seem like anything that he's doing is fluky. Uh, he's not shooting like a crazy high percentage. He's, he's just making plays all over the ice. So it's a, uh, it's a hundred percent hard work is what that is. And that, you know, it's, it's not all the time that you have someone that, that puts in the work that gets the results. You know, I mean, you can have someone that, that does everything they're supposed to do, takes care of their body, practices nonstop, and for whatever reason, it just doesn't – it doesn't – the execution doesn't work out. But this – I think what you're seeing with Tanner Janot is a perfect example of someone doing everything – like, and I say everything, I mean literally everything they can off the ice – to improve themselves as a player and then mm -hmm. seeing it pay off like in spades on the ice as well. It, it doesn't always happen, but you're seeing it happen with Jano. Yeah, it, it's awesome. And um, I do want to talk about uh, the, the coaching situation because uh, I know that Carl Taylor and Tanner Jano have a good history. Carl Taylor and a lot of these players have a good history. Um, so just to recap really quick, let's talk about the, the COVID thing. Uh, to my knowledge, there were eight players that were in COVID protocol, which, as I understand it, means that they tested positive for COVID. Don't know anything about symptoms or anything like that, but I do know that they prop that this means they tested positive. So that would be Ryan Johansson, Mikhail Granlund, uh, uh, Matt Luff, Michael McCarron, Ben Harper, Philip Tomasino, Mark Borowiecki, who was a very one of the very late scratches in the game against Colorado. And then yeah. Nick Cousins, who was that, who was a scratch or a, um, who went into protocol that day, earlier that day. So that's eight players. And then the entire coaching staff, John Hines, Dan uh, Lambert, 
Todd Richards, Ben Vanderklok, and Dan Hynode, all all five. And then also Matt Duchesne has an upper body injury. I don't know anything about that. That kind of got lost in all this. I, and he's just day to day. I don't know if we know anything yeah. about that. But I don't. Um, so Duchesne just injured. So Duchesne's not in COVID protocol as far as we know. Um, but then that means they called up Rocco Grimaldi, Cole Sherwood, Cody Glass, Matthew Olivier, and Cole Smith. Uh, and all those guys played. Every one of those guys played at least at some point. Yeah. Uh, Sherwood played in, uh, against Chicago, I think. And then the coaches on the bench were Carl Taylor, Scott Ford, and Scott Nickel, as we kind of mentioned. So um, I thought that this was such an amazing story for this for these last two games, is that the Carl Taylor-led Nashville Predators are 2-0. and And the guy that a lot of people were looking at as the successor to, at the time, Peter Laviolette, and then Peter Laviolette is fired, and then John Hines is hired kind of out of left field. Uh, the guy that a lot of people were looking at, Carl Taylor, who is now the head coach, who is obviously the head coach of the Milwaukee Admirals, uh, has this like jo- on the job interview and is now 2 and 0 and has, has proven that he can coach at the NHL level, not even with a full NHL staff. So, what do you think about all this, John? So as you a, say as, that, a, as an un, as an an unbridled fan of Carl Taylor, what do you think? Ooh, an unbridled fan of Carl Taylor. I first off, as you said it yourself. I love Carl Taylor, um, and I, I'll tell you, I, I I had only known what was happening in Milwaukee as as a bystander. I wasn't covering the team. I just would see the results and I would hear things about Carl Taylor, um, and then last season as the team started, you know, experiencing call-ups and things like that, you had a lot of guys that were coming straight from Taylor and were succeeding. And I reached out, I spoke with Carl Taylor personally, um, interviewed him and, and realized that what you've got in Carl Taylor, you've got something very, very special. And, and what I mean by that is he's a coach who at the AHL level understands that there's a dual role that, that would be uh, needs to be played. It's not just the, to be successful as a coach and having your team win games. You also need to coach your players well enough that they, they end up leaving you. And that's, and that's his reality is that if, if I do a good enough job with my players, I'm going to lose my players, but to still find success with the players that come in to fill those spots after you have guys go up Uh and to continue to do it on a consistent basis. You know, he's producing NHL players. He's taken someone like Tanner Janot, who I'm not going to take anything away from Janot, but you have someone like Janot, they come up against someone like Carl Taylor and they just realize how much benefit you can actually get out of that relationship where Taylor can build you into the player you need to be that when you get your chance at the NHL level, you do all of the things you need to do to make yourself stick up there. And that's mm-hmm. exactly what Janot's done, and he's done it with the help of Carl Taylor. And if he can do it with Janot, who's someone who comes completely, and I say completely out of left field in the sense that he's been undrafted at every level of hockey, yeah. even at the junior level. And People don't realize how difficult that is to make it <laughs> this far and not ever be drafted anywhere. I mean, he wasn't drafted anywhere. This was someone yeah. who would show up to – you know, tryouts and basically, you know, they're like, yeah, well, you know, he was good and strong. We'll, we'll give him a chance. We need to fill the spot it, it, to make a football comparison to be like a walk on and a, a guy being a walk on in college and then an undrafted free agent and then now be starting on an NFL team. Like yeah, that's what, no, that's, that's what that's this a, is. But and I, I say that, you know, again, I'm not going to take anything away from Janelle because I'll tell you why Carl Taylor wouldn't take anything away from Janelle. But if you look at the players that are coming out of Milwaukee, they're coming into Nashville ready to play and not ready to fill a hole, you know, or, or you know, be a, a bandage for a moment, but they're, they're ready to be role players on the team. And, and if you look at who's brought that identity back to the Predators, it's the guys from Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. I myself, when Peter Laviolette was fired, said, I would like to see Carl Taylor get a chance. And I was saying that based on my experience as a bystander. 
it's really hard for me because I'm a big John Hines fan as well. I like John Hines. I like what he's doing. I see his vision. I think it's a good one. The players are buying into it. But I would love Carl Taylor to be the head coach as well. I don't know if you can have two. I don't think that's a possible <laughs> thing. But the yeah. reality is my fear is – someone's going to see this and they're going to say, Hey, we've got an open coaching position. What do you think? And I wouldn't blame him for going because he's going to be successful wherever he goes because he can do what he's doing at the AHL level, at the NHL level, take existing players, round out their games. And I think you're going to see success on any team he goes to. I don't want him to go, but I'm afraid he's going to go. I think I think I think he's definitely going to be going somewhere. It, it is it is a very strange situation because I I like I think some people some people don't like the hire of John Hines, but I I, I did like the giant John Hines hire because of his, the way he the way he coaches his team as an educator. It's like mm-hmm. he's kind of a teacher first, and I think yeah. that's really really important in today's world. Like kind of approaching it from the mindset of I need to teach my guys how to play at this level as opposed to just yelling and and being uh, being an intimidator, uh, which I think is just basically going out go, going away. Yeah, uh, Carl Taylor though, what is is kind of a different mold? Uh, not not a different mold. He's 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 similar to John Hines in a lot of ways, but but he's he is kind of a almost like a, a sage, kind of like a, a a mentor sage kind of like presence where you you can see how he would get uh, certain kinds of guys to pull a lot out of their game that might not already be there. And um, that is, that is kind of like a next level coaching ability. When I, when I heard Carl Taylor in that post game and, you know, post game press conferences, you know, you never know how those are going to go. And it's easy to take too much out of those, but I really feel like I was listening to an NHL ready head coach. Like he, he is ready to be an NHL head coach. Um, I think he could go almost anywhere. Uh, and be real and really get a lot out of his players. Here's the problem: like I, they they made the John Hines hire. Do you know John Hines is younger than Carl Taylor? Do you know that? I believe that. Yeah, he's Hines is 46. Carl Taylor's 50. Uh, and those are pretty young. Those are both pretty young for like for head coaches. So like those guys have a lot of years left. I mean, I would say both coaches could coach for 20 more years in the in the league. I mean, that they're they're that if if they if they make it, you know that long um so yeah i mean if they made this john hines hire unless something goes south and and like the, he loses the team entirely which i don't see happening um it's going to be hines for for the foreseeable future they're, they're not going to replace hines with carl taylor so that means they're probably going to lose him and i think that's 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 definitely sad but it, it in some ways it's it's uh, makes you feel good about where you're where you're at with your organization because you got two coaches that are really really good. I wish you know you wish you could trade coaches, get some value out of that guy, uh, get, get some sort of asset for uh, for what he is. But I could definitely see him getting hired away. I mean, there's a lot of options out there: Florida, Vancouver. Um, you know, you never know what could happen with like an Arizona, Winnipeg. Uh, they don't. You know, Paul Maurice just just resigned because he wasn't the man for the job. There's a lot of options. I don't know that. Those options would be something that he would want to do, but you know, maybe, uh, p- perhaps. Um, so I think that's a that's a, been the most interesting part of this entire week is this how that guy came in and stepped up and and just made took that team and and won in situations that were very easy. It would have been very easy to lose, and uh, yeah, it was just it was really impressive to watch. I thought, and I'll tell you this. If uh, whichever team he ends up going to, if he does, again, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, put it in stone here or anything that it's that's happening. But whichever team he ends up going to, whenever that happens, they're definitely going to have a fan in me because I, I'd, I'd love to see that that process of him taking a team and making it his own and taking it where he's going to take it. That, that to me, that would be a, a show I would watch every every night. Yeah, I, I I would agree with that. You know, I think I, I wish we knew more about like the contract situations because I really don't know. Um, I really don't know anything about that, especially with him. Uh, they keep they keep coach contracts because there's no, they, no all that stuff is private. So like we don't know anything about how long coaches are hired for or whatever their contract situation is. Um, but it just 
you, you also kind of you wouldn't think that Carl Taylor would be a guy that just would stick at the AHL. I just seeing seeing everything that happened, I think he's going to be in the NHL at some point. So there you go. Um, I mean, it's it's been a, a crazy week. Um, and then what happened over the weekend this past weekend was on Sunday, I believe, or was it Saturday? It was Saturday, wasn't it? Saturday. We found out that the league was going to pause all of Nashville's games, Nashville and Boston, um, is going to pause all their games until after the holiday break, which would be uh, December 27th. So that means that three games in total would be would be postponed for the Predators. That would be Carolina, which is supposed to be yesterday at Carolina. Winnipeg tomorrow night, Tuesday night, which would have been a home game, and then Thursday at Florida, all postponed. Right. So the next potential game for the Nashville Predators is not till next Monday, which is the 27th, which is a week from today, we're recording this, um, the Dallas Stars. So, um, and uh, that means that there's no hockey for a week. And that the, that the hottest team in the NHL on a seven-game winning streak, the Nashville Predators – now have like nine days off. Um, that is unprecedented. That's not something that you really have ever see. I mean, even when they had the bye weeks uh, last year or the year before, there was only like six days off or five days off. So like they, yeah. there's, it's this crazy long break. Um, I'm not sure what that means for the team. I think at this point, there's so many unknowns. You just want everyone to be healthy and everyone come back from their COVID positive situation and be recovered and ready to go. I think that's more important, um, especially with the fact that the last two wins were very different because they had a bit different staff out there. So I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, when I, when I look at that list of players on the COVID protocol, you know, a lot of those guys have young children. And I think about as a parent going into the Christmas holiday, you know, uh, are, are they going to be stuck away from their children at Christmas? Cause that sounds awful to me. Um, yeah. I think I think the the best this is the best move they could have made yeah. at the time they made it. I think the best move they could have made would have been to do this a little bit earlier, mm. and maybe you know, it would have prevented some more guys from getting sick. But you know, hopefully, hopefully this is going to work out. Guys are going to be able to get healthy. The spread's going to be mitigated, um, and and I really hope that. Um, they're going to be able to spend Christmas with their families. I mean, that's yeah. just, you know, thinking about it from a completely human side of things and not a sports side of things. Uh, to me, that would be, that would be pretty sad, especially yeah. I think, I mean, yeah, there's some young kids on this, on that, in that group, there's some uh, pregnant spouses in that group. So it's just, that's not, it's not good. You don't want Yeah. I, I think, I, you know, um, it goes without saying that you know we all we hope that they're they're fine from their at, at the very at the very least we hope that they're asymptomatic and then if we we also hope that if they are symptomatic that it's mild. I had COVID and I, my, I was my symptoms were mild, but it still is not it's not fun. Like it, it's really nerve wracking because this was I mean I was vaccinated and I still got it and I was mild, but you know it's it's not it's not fun being locked in a room and being uh, kind of dealing with that. So. Anyways, we do hope that that's, that situation is, is recovered. I'm pretty confident that everything's going to be fine and they're going to be they're gonna recovered just fine. But um, what this does for the games and for the schedule, um, so the Predator, or sorry, the league set, set up this, this season so that there would be this three week break in February, between February, for the Predators at least, between February 1st and February 24th. So like yeah. over three weeks, there's nothing, there's nothing scheduled. That is when all these games are going to be played. So they have this huge gap in there. So these three games that were canceled, the Calgary game that was canceled, or post postponed, sorry, um, will all be scheduled in that time period at some point. So um, th these games are all going to be played. They're still going to get 82 games in as of right now. It's still, you know, they're still going to have their full 82. It does mean the Olympics are probably not going to happen. I think that's, there's nothing official there yet, but it doesn't seem like that's going to happen now. Um so yeah, I I, I think um, it is good that they built that schedule this way, and and but again, they they probably should have done it a little earlier. I mean, they, they could easily schedule those have scheduled that Colorado game or the Chicago game during that time too, but they just opted to play it. So, Ugh, man, 
really hope that this is the last time we have to deal with this. Yeah, I'm with you big time. I, yeah. It's uh, it just keeps going. It just keeps going. <laughs> um, all right. I, I think that does it for our show. I mean, like we, we, we're probably going to, um, we're probably going to take next week off because there's not going to be nothing to talk about and it's holidays. So we're going to not do a show next week. And then uh, we'll see about the following week, assuming that they go, do come back to play. Um, we'll, uh, we'll do a show then. Um, so probably not until another couple weeks will we, uh, we have another episode of on the Preds. Are you, are you okay with that? You, you good for a, so a couple weeks off? You're telling me that we won't, that the people won't hear or see us for it until next year. Unless they follow us on Twitter. Well, that's a great idea. Yeah. They should do that. So, yes, please check out all of our hockey coverage at a to z sports nashville.com and then also go to on the forecheck.com, read Sean and everyone over there. Uh, they do a great job. Keep that work up over there at OTF. Um, love that site and uh, keep it going. So, follow me on Twitter at AlexDarty1. Follow Sean on Twitter at SCSOTF. Um, everyone have a safe and wonderful holiday. Everyone stay. Stay as uh, as healthy as possible through this these un, unprecedented times that are really more precedented than anything <laughs> because we've been through this before. But uh, any any final thoughts you want to throw out there before we conclude? I just want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. There you go. Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> oh, I'm not God. doing that. I probably said that. <laughs>